Sweat by Zora Neale Hurston, 1926. Zora Neale Hurston, 1891 and 1960, was an African-American novelist, short story writer, folklorist, anthropologist, and one of the most important figures of the Harlem Renaissance. Hurston set many of her works, including Sweat in Florida, and used the distinctive dialect of the region in her writing. The following text also contains language that some people may consider offensive, as well as reference to domestic violence. Skill focus. In this lesson, you'll practice analyzing a text structure and how it contributes to the text's meaning and impact. This means paying attention to when and how an author chooses to reveal crucial information and begin and end a story. As you read, take note of how Delia's attitude towards Sykes changes over the course of the story. It was 11 o'clock of a spring night in Florida. It was Sunday. Any other night, Delia Jones would have been in bed for two hours by this time. But she was a washwoman, and Monday morning meant a great deal to her. So she collected the soiled clothes on Saturday when she returned to when she returned the clean things. Sunday night after church, she sorted them and put the white things to soak. It saved her almost a half day's start. A great hamper in the bedroom held the clothes that she brought home. It was so much neater than a number of bundles lying around. She squatted in the kitchen floor beside the great pile of clothes, sorting them into heaps according to color and humming a song in a mournful key, but wandering through it all where Sykes, her husband, had gone with her horse and buckboard. Just then, something long, round, limp, and black fell upon her shoulders and slithered to the floor beside her. A great terror took hold of her. It softened her knees and dried her mouth so that it was a full minute before she could cry out or move. Then she saw that it was the big bull whip her husband liked to carry when he drove. She lifted her eyes to the door and saw him standing there bent over with laughter at her fright. She screamed at him, Sykes, would you throw that whip on me like that? You know it would scare me. Looks just like a snake and you knows how scared I is of snakes. Of <clears throat> course I knows it. That's how I come I done it. <laughs> he slapped his leg with his hand and almost rolled on the ground in his mirth. If you such a big fool that you got to have a fit over an earthworm or a string, I don't care how bad I scare you. You ain't got no business doing it. God knows it's a sin. Someday I'm going to drop dead from some of your foolishness. Another thing, where you been with my rig? I feed that pony. He ain't for you to be driving with no bullwhip. You show us one aggravating woman, he declared and stepped into the room. She resumed her work and did not answer him at once. I done told you time and again to keep them white folks' clothes out of this house. He picked up the whip and glared down at her. Delia went on with her work. She went out into the yard and returned with a galvanized tub and set it on the wash bench. She saw that Sykes had kicked all of the clothes together again and now stood in her way truculently, his whole manner hopping, praying, hoping, praying for an argument. But she walked calmly around him and commenced to resort the things. And next time, I'm going to kick them outdoors, he threatened as he struck a match along the leg of his corduroy breeches. Delia never looked up from her work, and her thin, stooped shoulders sagged further. I ain't for no fuss tonight, Sykes. I just come from taking sacrament at the church house. He snorted scornfully. Yeah, you just come from the church house on a Sunday night, but here you is going to work on them clothes. You ain't nothing but a hypocrite. One of them amen corner Christians sing, whoop, and shout, then come home and wash white folks' clothes on the Sabbath. He stepped roughly upon the whitest pile of things, kicking them helter-skelter as he crossed the room. His wife gave a little scream of dismay and quickly gathered them together again. Sykes, you quit grinding dirt into these clothes. How can I get through by Saturday if I don't start on Sunday? I don't care 
if you never get through. Anyhow, I done promised God and a couple other men I ain't going to have it in my house. Don't give me no lip neither, else I'll throw them out and put my fist upside your head to boot. Delilah's habitual meekness seemed to slip from her shoulders like a brown, a blown scarf. She was on her feet, her poor little body, her bare knuckly hands bravely defying the strapping hulk before her. Look here, Sykes, you done gone too far. I've been married to you for 15 years, and I've been taken in washing for 15 years. Sweat, 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 work and sweat. Crying sweat, praying sweat. What's that got to do with me? He asked brutally. What's it got to do with you, Sykes? My tub is full of suds. It's filled your belly with vittles more times than your hands has filled it. My sweat is done paid for this house, and I reckon I can keep on sweating in it. She seized the iron skillin from the stove and struck a defensive pose, which act surprised him greatly coming from her. It cowed him. And he did not strike her as he usually did. No, you won't, she panted. That old snaggletooth black woman you running with ain't coming here to pile up on my sweat and blood. You ain't paid for nothing on this place. And I'm going to stay right here until I'm toted out foot foremost. Well, you better get quick getting me riled up. Else I'll be toting you out sooner than you expect. I'm so tired of you, I don't know what to do. God, how I hate skinny women. A little awed by this new Delia, he sidled out of the door and slammed the back gate after him. He did not say where he had gone, but she knew too well. She knew very well that he would not return until nearly daybreak also. He worked her work over. She went on to bed, but not to sleep at once. Things had come to a pretty pass. She lay awake, gazing upon the debris that cluttered their matrimonial trail. Not an image left standing alone the way. Anything like flowers had long ago been drowned in the salty stream that had been pressed from her heart, her tears, her sweat, her blood. She had brought love to the union, and he had brought a longing after the flesh. Two months after the wedding, he had given her the first brutal beating. She had the memory of his numerous trips to Orlando with all of his wages when he had returned to her penniless, even before the first year had passed. She was young and soft then, but uh, she was young and soft then, but now she was through of her knotty muscled limbs, her harsh knuckled hands and drew herself up into an unhappy little ball in the middle of of the big feather bed. Too late now to hope for love, even if it were not Bertha, it would be someone else. This case differed from the others, only in that she was bolder than the others. Too late for everything except her little home. She had built it for her old days and planted one by the trees and flowers there. It was lovely to her, lovely. Somehow, before sleep came, she found herself saying aloud, oh well, whatever goes over the devil's back is got to come under his belly. Sometime or other, Sykes, like everybody else, is going to reap his sowing. After that, she was able to build a spiritual earthworks against her husband. His shells could no longer reach her. Amen. She went to sleep and slept until he announced his presence in bed by kicking her feet and rudely snatching the covers away. Give me some cover here and get your damn foots over on your own side. I ought to mash you in your mouth for drawing that skillet on me. Delia went clear to the rail without answering him. A triumphant indifference to all that he was or did. The week was as full of work for Delia as all other weeks. And Saturday found her behind her little pony, collecting and delivering clothes. It was a hot, hot day near the end of July. The village men on Joe Clark's porch even chewed cane listlessly. They did not hurl the cane knots as usual. They let them dribble over the edge of the porch. 
even conversation had collapsed under the heat. Here comes Delia Jones, Jim Merchant said, as the shaggy pony came round the bend of the road toward them. The rusty buckboard was heaped with baskets of crisp, clean laundry. Yep, Joe Lindsay said, agreed. Hot or cold, rain or shine, just as regular as the weeks roll round, Delia carries them and fetches them on Saturday. She better if she want to eat, said Moss. Psych Jones ain't worth the shot and powder hit would tick to kill him. Not to her, you ain't. Me show ain't, Walter Thomas chimed in. It's too bad, too, because she was a right pretty little trick when he got her. I'd have mad at myself if he hadn't to beat me to it. Delia nodded briefly at the men as she drove past. Too much knocking will ruin any woman. He done beat her enough to kill three women, let alone change their looks, said Elijah Mosley. How sight can stomach that big black greasy mogul he's laying around with gets me. I swear that eight rock couldn't kiss a sardine can I done throw it out the back no way last year. Oh, she's fat. That's how come. He always been crazy about fat women, put in Merchant. He'd have been tied up with one a long time ago if he could have found one to have him. Did I tell you about him come sliding around my wife, bringing her a basket of pecans out of his yard for a present? Yes, sir, my wife. She told him to take him right straight back home because Delia worked so hard over that wash tub. She reckoned everything on the place tastes like sweat and soap suds. I just wished I could have caught him there. I made his hips catch on fire down that shell road. I know he done it too. I sees him grinning at every woman that passes, Walter Thomas said. But even so, he used to eat some mighty big hunks of humble pie to get a little old woman he got. She was as pretty as a speckled pup. That was 15 years ago. He used to be so scared of losing her. She could make him do some parts of a husband's duty. They never was the same in the mind. There ought to be a law about him, said Lindsay. He ain't fit to carry guts to a bear. Clark spoke for the first time. Tain't no law on earth that can make a man be decent if it ain't in him. There's plenty of men that takes a wife like they do uh, join a sugar cane. It's round, juicy, and sweet when they gets it, but they squeeze and grind and squeeze and grind and ring and ring and ring every drop of pleasure that's in them out. When they's satisfied, they is wrung dry, they treats them just like they do a, ch a cane chew. They throws them away. They knows what they's doing while they's at it and hates themselves for it, but they keeps on hanging after her till she's empty. And then they hates her for being a cane chew and in the way. We ought to take Syke and that stray woman of his and down into the Lake Howell swamp and lay on the raw hide till they can't say, Lord of mercy. He always was a overbearing nigger, but that white woman over from up north done teach him how to run an automobile. He done got too bigoted to live and we ought to kill him. Old man Anderson advised. A grunt of approval went around the porch, but the heat was melting their civic virtue. And Elijah Mosley began to bait Joe Clark. Come on, Joe, get a melon out of there and slice it up for your customers. We's all suffering with the heat. The bear's done gone, got me. That's right, Joe. A watermelon is just what a, a needs to cure the Epizetics, uh, Walter Thomas joined forces with Mosley. Come on there, Joe. We all is steady customers, and you ain't set us up in a long time. I chooses that long, bow-legged, floridy favorite. I got him, be though you all give me 20 cents and slice away, Clark retorted. I needs a cold slice myself. Here, everybody chip in. I'll lend you my meat knife. The money was quickly subscribed and the huge melon brought forth. 
At that moment, Sykes and Bertha arrived. A determined silence fell on the porch, and the melon was put away again. Merchant snapped down the blade of his jackknife and moved toward the store door. Come on in, Joe, and give me a slab of so belly and a pound of coffee. I almost forgot twas Saturday. Got to get on home. Most of the men left also. And just then, Delia drove past her way home as Sykes was ordering magnificently for Bertha. It pleased him for Delia to see. Get whatsoever your heart desires, honey. Wait a minute, Joe. Give her two bottles of strawberry soda water, a quarter of parched uh, ground peas, and a block of chewing gum. With all this, they left the store, with Sykes reminding Bertha that this was his town and she could have it if she wanted it. The men returned soon after they left and held their watermelon feast. Where did Sykes Jones get the woman from know-how? Lindsay asked. Over Popka? Guess they must have been cleaning out the town when she left. She don't look a, like a thing but a hunk of liver with a hair on it. Well, she sure can squall, Dave Carter contributed. When she gets ready to laugh, she just opens her mouth and latches it back to the last notch. No grandpa alligator down in Lake Bell ain't got nothing on her. Bertha had been in town three months now. Sykes was still paying her room rent at Della Lewis, the only house in town that had would take uh, that would have taken her in. Sykes took her frequently to Winter Park to stomps. He assured her that he was the swellest man in the state. Show sure you can have that little old house soon as I can get that woman out of here. Everything belongs to me, and you sure can have it. I show abominates a skinny woman. Lordy, you show you show has got one portly shape on you. You can get anything you want. This is my town, and you show can have it. Delia's work worn knees crawled over the earth in Gethsemane and up the rocks of Calvary many, many times during these months. She avoided the villagers and meeting places in her efforts to be blind and deaf, but Bertha nullified this to a degree by coming to Delia's house to call Sykes out to her at the gate. Delia and Sykes fought all the time now with no peaceful interludes. They slept and ate in silence, Two or three times, Delia had attempted to uh, attempted a timid friendliness, but she was repulsed each time. It was plain that the breaches must remain agape. The sun had burned July to August. The heat streamed down like a million hot arrows, smiting all the things living upon the earth. Grass withered, leaves brown, snakes went blind and shedding, and men and dogs went mad dog days. Delia came home one day and found Sykes there before her. She wondered, but started to go on into the house without speaking, even though he was standing in the kitchen door and she must either stoop under his arm or ask him to move. He made no room for her. She noticed a soapbox beside the steps, but paid no particular attention to it, knowing that he must have brought it there. As she was stooping to pass under his outstretched arm, he suddenly pushed her backward, laughingly. Look in the box there, Delia. I done brung you something. She nearly fell upon the box in her stumbling, and when she saw what it held, she all but fainted outright. Psych, psych, my God! You take that rattlesnake away from here! You got to Oh, Jesus, have mercy! Psych, psych, my God, you take that rattlesnake away from here. You got to. Oh, Jesus, have mercy. I ain't got to do nothing of the kind. Fact is, I ain't got to do nothing but die. Tain't no use of you putting on airs, making out like you scared uh, of that snake. He's going to stay right here till he die. He wouldn't bite me because I knows how to handle him. Know how he wouldn't risk breaking out his fangs against you skinny legs. Now, no, now, psych, don't, don't keep that thing around here to scare me 
to death. You knows I, I'm even fear to earthworms. That's the biggest snake I ever did see. Kill him, Sack, please. Don't ask me to do nothing for you. Going around trying to be so damn asterperious. No, I ain't gonna kill it. I think I damn sight more him than you. Uh, that's a nice snake, and anybody don't like him can get just, just, just hit the grit. The village soon heard that Sykes had the snake and came to see and ask questions. How the hen fire did you catch that six foot rattler, Syke? Thomas asked. He's full of frogs, so he can't hardly move, that's how. I eased up on him, but I'm a snake charmer and I knows how to handle him. Shucks, that ain't nothing. I could catch one every day if I sure wanted to. What he needs is a heavy hickory club leaned real heavy on his head. That's the best way to charm a rattlesnake. No, well, you just don't understand these diamond backs like I do said Sykes in a superior tone of voice. The village agreed with Walter, but the snake stayed on. His box remained by the kitchen door with its screen wire covering. Two or three days later, it had digested its meal of frogs and literally came to life. It rattled at every movement in the kitchen or the yard. One day, as Delia came down the kitchen steps, she saw his chalky white fangs curved like scimitars hung in the wire meshes. This time, she did not run away with averted eyes as usual. She stood for a long time in the doorway in a red fury that grew bloodier for every second that she regarded the creature that was her torment. That night, she broached the subject as soon as Sykes sat down to the table. Sykes, I want you to take that snake away from here. You done starved me and put up with you. You done beat me and I took that, but you done killed all my insides bringing that varmin here. Sykes poured out a saucer full of coffee and drank it deliberately before he answered her. A whole lot I care about how you feels inside and out. That snake ain't going no damn well till I gets ready for him to go. So as far as beating is concerned, you ain't took near all you're gonna take if you stay around me. Delia pushed back her plate and got up from the table. I hate you, Sykes, she said calmly. I hate you to, you, to, the, to the same degree that I used to love you. I done took... My belly, I done took and took my belly as full up to my neck. That's the reason I got my letter from the church and moved my membership to Woodbridge. So I don't have to take no sacrament with you. I don't want to see you around me at all. Lay around with that woman of you wants to, but go on away from me in my house. I hate you like a suck egg dog. Sykes almost let the huge wad of cornbread and collard greens he was chewing fall out of his mouth in amazement. He had a hard time whipping himself up to the proper fury to try to answer Delia. Well, I'm glad you does hate me. I'm sure it's hard of you hanging on to me. I don't want you. Look at your stringy old neck. Your raw bony legs and arms is enough to cut a man to death. You looks just like the devil's doll baby to me. You can't hate me no worse than I hate you. I've been hating you for years. Yo, black high don't look nothing to like look your old black high don't look like nothing to me but a parcel of wrinkled up rubber with your old big ears flapping on each side Hair buzzard wings don't think I'm going to be around from the house neither. I'm going to the wife folks about you, my young man, the very next time you lay your hands on me. My cup is done run over. 
Delia said this with no signs of fear, and Sykes departed from the house, threatening her, but made not the slightest move to carry out any of them. That night, he did not return at all, and the next day, being Sunday, Delia was glad she did not have to quarrel before she hitched up her pony and drove the four miles to Woodbridge. She stayed to the night service, Love Beast, which was very warm and full of spirit. In the emotional winds, her domestic trials were borne far and wide so that she sang as she drove homeward. Turn water back, black and cold, chills the body, not the soul. And I'll want to cross Jordan in a calm time. She came from the barn to the kitchen door and stopped. What's the matter, old Satan? You ain't kicking up oh, your racket. She addressed the snake's box. Complete silence. She went on to the house with a new hope in its birth struggles. Perhaps her threat to go to the white folks had frightened Sykes. Perhaps he was sorry. Fifteen years of misery and suppression had brought Delia to the place where she would hope anything that looked towards a way over or through or her wall of inhibitions. She felt in the match safe behind the stove for once. Uh, she felt in the match safe behind the stove at once for a match. There was only one there. That nigga wouldn't fetch nothing here to save his rotten neck. But he can run through what I brings quick enough. Now he done towed it off nigh onto half a box of matches. He done had that woman here in my house too. Nobody but a woman could tell how she knew this even before she struck the match. But she did it and put it into a new fury. Presently, she brought in the tubs to put the white things to soak. This time, she decided she need not bring the hamper out of the bedroom. She would go in there and do the sorting. She picked up the pot-bellied lamp and went in. The room was small, and the hamper stood hard by the foot of the white iron bed. She could sit and reach through the bedposts, resting as she worked. I want to cross the Jordan in a calm time, she was singing again. The mood of the love feast had returned. She threw back the lid of the basket almost gaily. Then, moved by both horror and terror, she brang, uh, sprang back toward the door. There lay the snake in the basket. He moved sluggishly at first, but even as she turned around and round, jumped up and down in the insanity of fear, he began to stir vigorously. She saw him pouring his awful beauty from the basket upon the bed, and then she seized the lamp and ran as fast as she could to the kitchen. The wind from the open door blew out the light, and the darkness added to her terror. She sped to the darkness of the yard, slamming the door after her before she thought to set down the lamp. She did not feel safe even on the ground, so she climbed up in the hay barn. There for an hour or more, she lay sprawled upon the hay, a, a gibbering wreck. Finally, she grew quiet, and after that, coherent thought. With this, stalked through her a cold, bloody rage. Hours of this. A period of introspection. A space of retrospection. Then, a mixture of both. Out of this, an awful calm. Well, I done the best I could. If things ain't right, God knows it ain't my fault. She went to sleep, a twitch sleep, and woke up to a faint gray sky. There was a loud, hollow sound below. She peered out. Sykes was at the wood pile, demolishing a wire-covered box. He hurried to the kitchen drawer, but hung outside there some minutes before he entered, and stood some minutes more inside before he closed it after him. The gray in the sky was spreading. Delia descended without fear now and crouched beneath the low bedroom window. The drawn shade shut out the dawn, shut in the night. But the thin walls held back no sound. That old scratch is woke up now. She must at the tremendous whir inside, which every woodsman knows is one of the sound illusions. The rattler is a ventriloquist. His whir sounds to the right, to the left, straight ahead, behind, 
close underfoot everywhere but where it is. Woe to him who guesses wrong unless he is prepared to hold up his end of the argument. Sometimes he strikes without rattling at all. Inside, Sykes heard nothing until he knocked a pot lid off the stove while trying to reach the match safe in the dark. He had emptied his pockets at Bertha's. The snake seemed to wake up under the stove and Sykes made a quick leap into the bedroom. In spite of the gin he had had, his head was clearing now. My God, he chattered, if I could only struck a light. The rattling ceased for a moment and he stood paralyzed. He waited. It seemed that the snake waited also. Oh, for the light, I thought he'd be too sick. Sykes was muttering to himself when the whir began again, closer, right underfoot this time. Long before this, Sykes' ability to think had been flattened down to primitive instinct, and he leaped onto the bed. Outside, Delia heard a cry that might have come from a maddened chimpanzee, a stricken gorilla. All the terror, all the horror, all the rage that man possibly could express without a recognizable human sound. A tremendous stir inside there. Another series of animal screams, the intermittent whir of the reptile. The shade torn violently down from the window, letting in the red dawn. A huge brown hand seizing the window stick. Great dull blows upon the wooden floor, punctuating the gibberish of sound long after the rattle of the snake had abruptly subsided. All this Delia could see and hear from her place beneath the window, and it made her ill. She crept over to the four o'clock and stretched herself on the cool earth to recover. She lay there. Delia! Delia! She could hear Sykes calling in a most despairing tone as one who expected no answer. The sun crept on up and he called. Delia could not move. Her legs were gone flabby. She never moved. He called and the sun kept rising. My God, she heard him moan. My God from heaven, she heard him stumbling about and got up from her flower bed. The sun was growing warm. As she approached the door, she heard him call out, hopefully, Delia, is that you I hear? She saw him on his hands and knees as soon as she reached the door. He crept an inch or two toward her, all that he was able, and she saw his horribly swollen neck and his one open eye, shining with hope. A surge of pity too, the surge of pity too strong to support, bore her away from that eye that must, could not fail to see the tubs. He would see the lamp. Orlando, with its doctors, was too far. She could scarcely reach the chinaberry tree where she waited in the growing heat, while inside she knew the cold river was creeping up and up to extinguish that eye, which must know by now that she knew.